those are the, that's what this committee, this group of people, this, this community group, felt were the, the places where we need to go for our students in our district, for our community, to raise up the best next citizens that we could for the 22nd century, right? I mean, we're looking further along. So in that, I just wanted to, I just want you guys to take some time to review it again. I want our board to look at it again and make sure that when we are, and as we do this, we look forward and we say, okay, are we committing to the strategic plan for this district as we're looking at our budget and working through those things? Um, always having to balance how can we strong, you know, how can we uh, financially provide services and meet the needs of our kids, but also work with our taxpayers. Um, that's probably been said a lot more in this year than I have ever had the pleasure of dealing with it in the 23 years, I guess, I've been in this role, which is a ridiculous amount of time, by the way. Um, this has been probably the most sort of um, contentious, and I don't mean that in a way that is that it sounds like, but I've not seen the level of sort of discourse that we've had regarding um, the idea of the constituent piece. That's new for us, honestly. It really, truly is new that um, the school board has had to really kind of rethink their, where, where they think. And so I'm just, I'm asking you as a board and as our members of the audience just to be listening, for us to really be thinking about that, about what's first for us. Um, and it is, in my opinion, our strategic plan is about our kids and about our future. So that is one of the biggest pieces that I want for us to always consider as we go forward. Um, and I want the audience to know that even as we're doing that, we're also trying to be fiscally responsible. <laughs> it's not simple. Um, if you take out the other piece, there's a graph that has, um, and honestly, we stole this. That's kind of fun, right? You take it from others. Um, and this 35 actually put this together, but it, well, they, they took this information, and it's about per pupil spending um, from 2018 19 to 18 more. Just one? Okay. Did you do some more? Okay, pass that one now. Um, again, guys, this is the front. We made enough for everybody. There, uh, by the way, I counted. I think I did a pretty good job. We had like 222 people here tonight. That is amazing. <laughs> and I like it. Um, it is awesome. It's awesome. So the, the graph that you have in front of you is what's put together, and it's based on the school that attend the Stanford Regional Technical Center. So these are the students that, these are the schools that are in your county basically and they're providing. If you look at this, this graph, we are the maroon line at the bottom. And you can see over the years from 2018 and it goes to the end of 2023 because 23, 24 spending is not firmly in place yet. You know, it's not finalized. It shows where Noble stands. We are below the state average, so fairly significantly below the state average. We are the second lowest spender in the county on our students. Um, of the very top line is York. We don't compare New York in any way, shape, or form for size um, and financial ability because they just have a different tax base than we do. That's the reality. What we do have in here is a couple of, a few schools that are not like right around us, but um, Massabesic, we are often compared to Massabesic, to Sanford, to, um, well there's, typically we're also compared to like um, MSPD, which is Bonnie Eagle, because of the consolidated groups. But this is just straightforward that New York County schools. So when we share this information, we should share it with our public because we do provide a lot for a little, comparatively speaking. So take this and share it with everybody you know. Um, when you're standing in the bowl, let them have it. <laughs> because this, I mean, it truly is. Um, the only school actually that's gone down is in uh, MSCD 57, and that really is, um, Currently, they are working hard 
to get back up into the, into the range that is necessary for them. So I just want people to understand that there is some true disparity in our county, and we do a lot with this, with what people are, the, what are our citizens <coughs> are able to give to us. Um, again, and this is per pupil spending, it takes out debt service and it takes out transportation. So just food for thought as we talk about the budget ahead of us. Sure. I'm sorry, I guess make sure I speak into the mic. Yeah. Um, so we acknowledge that transportation for our district is a lot. Like yeah. we are, we are a very large district. Yeah. We are. Are we? Are we in the top five as far as transportation in the state? Somewhere I think there? we are in terms of miles traveled. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, that's a significant part of our, of our budget. Yeah. Um, Fifty-seven is similar. Yeah. yeah. And then, and then the other thing I just ask him as far as uh, do we know if if because. Grant monies are, are a big part. Do we know if grant monies were included in this, or is it just strictly this tax strictly tax funded? Tax funded. Yep. Okay. Thank you for the issue, sir. All right. Okay. So here we go. Here we go. So what's going on? Um, what's being passed out right now are the budget considerations decision sheet. And I'm sorry, we have we don't have copies for everyone. It's <laughs> not a Madam Chair, sure. may I ask a question? Can we uh, explain a little bit what that sheet is um, so that they can yeah, see going to what we're passing around first? Thank you. Yeah, sure. yeah. We need one. <laughs> Thank you. Perfect. So this sheet is a running document of questions of um, different expenses and revenue that we have gone through or that we will be um, reviewing this evening. And this is, a, this is the part that the board typically works on as far as once there is a budget presented by the, board, by the school, the board takes it. This is the place for questions and looking for further information. Um, in addition, it, lists, it also lists, if you don't have a copy of that, there were some. Um, it lists some recommendations from the district, from the school um, administration, district administration. And then on the back of that were things that were, met, were brought up last week to get further information on. So to clarify, that document, those, in, those pieces of information that were brought forward last week were um, just topics that the board wished to collect or board members wished to collect information on. So it wasn't the whole board acting on anything, rather it was, could we have more information? Would we be able to see this? This is part of the process, is to collect the information, to go through it, and work through piece by piece, information by information. So that's what this document is, is right now in front of us. Is that? Um, just could you explain how it was collected on the email size, just so that they know what's coming so, from the short person? So questions. it's yep. So it's this is a Google Doc, and what that means is um, that the board has a shared document and can write down questions, can write down um, topics that they wish to talk about. So that was what the reverse of this list is came up from the previous week, and that is what we will be discussing this week. So it's a running document where the board is able to write down questions, we can answer the questions, we can also provide written documentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so if, if we look at the top of this, we have um, already agreed upon increases and decreases. So as we go through that, uh, we have the re reduction in workers, workers' compensation expenses, uh, remove unfilled bus driver positions, remove technology application reading plus, add faculty student capacity study. Um, so I will talk a little bit about that because that is not a decrease, but that is something that we had talked about that came up as part of looking at um, the space and the longevity of London Elementary School 
and um, at our previous board meeting, the board uh, discussed putting money into that study, which is going to could take six months, eight months. Um, but what that will do is give us a really good picture of the entire district, so that when we're looking at um, K-5, 6-7, 8-12, um, an eventual addition of preschool, we'll have really good laid out information. So when we have to make shifts, which we know we will have to, uh, we can make very thoughtful shifts and not have to keep disrupting student uh, transitions while we while we try to catch up. So it's really giving us a big overview of that. And just a quick clarification, it's at uh, facility, student yes. capacity, yes. Uh, not that. Sorry. <laughs> facility. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Um, so for revenue, um, we have efficiency main, we have main care billing, which we pre previously discussed, and the Tri-Town Mobile. So as we look at all of that, um, that goes to, if you see those totals, that comes up to 692.605, um, which is revised increase to taxpayers. Um, and that would be 10.64% from the current 14.07%. So that was all we discussed and, and moved forward to reflect in, in the next phase of the budget draft. This next section, we started and began to discuss some of these um, pieces, but we did not yet um, have a strong poll on all of them, so we're going to go through them um, right now. You do have a green card uh, per uh, uh, suggested it may be easier to just hold up a green card. So the most um, efficient manner to get through this is to do the straw, to have a straw pool, to see if there's more, we, there are some things on here we have more information to share with you, and then we will ask for further questions. If there's no further questions, we'll take a quick straw pool. Uh, yes. Can we, can we remind them that a straw pool is not binding? Great. Can you speak into the mic, Jerry? I'm trying. Just please. I didn't want to use the mic, okay? You're far away, I can't hear you if you're not in that mic. Okay, I'll try and speak loud. Um, the, the study expense. So, the one that we've done um, when you were looking at extend schools cannot be used, reused for the same thing. We need a new, a new study. The study that was done when That's the buildings. We yeah, we're going to do the study. Right. Did all the additions. Yes. The there wasn't an official updated study okay. prior to the planning of the, in the increase in the schools. I think the, the, the reality of that is, is that. Well, the architects came in and did, they went to the school and made their recommendations, yes. but it wasn't official. Well, the significance of that was is it was an expansion project across the board, as opposed to looking at the district and saying, how can we reconfigure without additional buildings, like in the three tap, in the three towns. So it was a broader um, construction project versus a let's look at what we can do and ship some things around. Okay, and and then I had one other question: is that the Bookmobile bill hasn't that been defunct for? It has been. Yeah, so it has been. Has it continued to be on the budget then? Has it been in, in the budget? We had planned to, we had hoped to be able to use this money to purchase another vehicle to continue with the mobile. Um, we were unable to do so. So now we're, we're using this as an opportunity to take that money to offset. So at this point, it's a, it's a total elimination. Right. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Okay, so we have the removal of parking lot B paving. Again, these are administrative recommendations. This is $108,850. Um, there was a question about gravel, um, finding out um, the feasibility and the price of using gravel for this versus what we've been using for asphalt. It's kind of yeah. is. All right, Kevin. Yeah. Wake up, Kevin. <laughs> yeah. I have been so waiting so patiently. Oh, no. You do. You've got to explain that first, Kevin. What's that? What you're holding in your right hand. No. Uh, I had a meeting with Sue and Arvid today. <laughs> <laughs> you just call it Kevin. Uh, 
Dang. Can you help me real quick? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so real quick, um, this is a follow-up to a request made by the board back in my budget presentation. As far as was there an alternative to resurfacing the B parking lot and the example um, was made, is it possible to do what the town of Lettering um, did on Summer Road, which was a type of resurface but at a lower cost um, and less expensive. However, um, I've sent out some photos to you that I'll kind of go over with you when, when I get to that. Um, but the, the um, alternative to what Lebanon did as far as Senate Room, yes, it is a possibility. Um, however, the drawbacks to it is the process that they use requires to have that process repeated every seven to ten years. And also along with that, um, there's documentation I gave to as well, that um, also it can be damaged, the type of material, not the material, but the process they use, that is winter snow removal and ice removal, removal can damage that type of um, resurfacing that they did. Um, so it's like the photos that I showed you are um, set up on itself. So if you see, like, I'm not sure exactly what order I put them in, but the first one I think has a big section where you can see where it's peeled up. Uh, again, this process was done only seven months ago. On seven. So I'm not, <laughs> I'm not willing to put um, the district's um, expense to trying something experiment here that I just given you information on that's not currently feasible already in seven months. So um, this is many more photos I took, but I always sent you four that gave you an idea of you know what I'm talking about. Um, so that's kind of where we are with that. Um, yes, it is an option, but it's not in the district's best interest, only because of the seven to ten year time frame and also damage from snow and ice removal. Um, and I certainly don't want to be out here in the back of right up here um, watching big tons of Resurfacing material, plow up and go, oh, that's not going to be a good explanation. So, um, again, um, our parking lots are in very good shape, but it's also remember that they're original pavement, so they're 24 years old, so they held up very, very well um, in discussions with Denise Sumner. I have no problem if we have to push this back another year, and the reason I say that is because I think there are other possibilities oh. where I would like to, let me back up. We put this into this year's budget because we actually started repaving projects last year here at the high school. This was the last school that we had to do in the district. We did all the other buildings in the past five to seven, eight years. Uh, so this was the last one that actually needed to start resurfacing. Um, and again, the ideal thing would be able to do them all at once, do the entire facility at once, but knowing that it's tight with our budget and what it costs to do these parking lots, because they are mid-sized parking lots, is that it's you couldn't do the whole facility in one general budget. So we stopped the process last year, started doing resurfacing, and was trying to get on a five to six year plan. So in six years, we'd have this all, the facility completely resurfaced parking lots only. That's not addressing the main access rooms. So currently that's kind of where we are in a nutshell. Um, so yes, to answer your questions, it can be done, but it's not the best interest. Uh, clarifying question, if you don't mind. Uh, so you mentioned that the building is completely resurfaced. Yes. Um, we're responsible for the access roads as well? Correct. Okay, just to cover. Yes. It's the, we're responsible for the access roads, but they are right away from the town of where they come from. Route nine to the church. All right. And Kevin, just uh, thinking about the, the phases, uh, it's going to take six years to pave, so we're going to be out seven years before we complete this Correct. complex. And, and you're comfortable in saying that our asphalt is going to last? 
that for you? I'm very comfortable saying that. Um, again, going back to what I said, was, was the, I'd like to stay on that cycle as far as continuing doing and not starting a project and then putting on the back burner and then picking up two or three years from now. Um, I think that there are, are other options that can be explored, such as bond packages, where we can do the whole entire facility all at once and um, finance it over a period of time. So it's like, but it's, it's important to understand that it is 23, 24 years old, so it's held up very, very well, but also it's kind of getting to where we either resurface or we're going to get to a point where we have to reclaim, and then you're talking about the cost. So. Kevin, okay, just for the access road itself, now that there's two residences on the road as well, uh, have we thought of going to the town and asking them to take that as a public road? Uh, I don't think that really matters because you can have two on a private way and it's still our responsibility to do. Once it becomes three dwellings on, 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 a, on the right of way, it would be a town, excuse me, it would be a town responsibility then. Sorry, I mean, in Burwick, I know when they build the road to a certain spec, you can approach the town and ask them to take it as a town road. Right, and I think can we do that here. Right, and I think in the town of Millburg, don't quote me, but I can look into this, but I think it's two or less more. It's going to be because it's the same situation I live in with, where me and my wife We have two <laughs> dwellings on our private way, but the town doesn't maintain it. That's just, that's. Just the, um, uh, what's the word I want to use? I'm sorry. So the third one is the trigger? The third one would be the trigger, correct. So there is three of them. What's that? There's two houses and us, so I would consider that three plus the bus. Uh, no, it's, it's two different things. You're talking residential and you're talking in this one. Okay. I'd be curious to look into that one. I can, sir, I, I can inquire about it. Any minutes? Can I go home? So just clarifying this to make sure I understand. <laughs> Sorry. I, you know, it, it takes a little while for this brain to like, you know, engage and think, so I know you'll leave it there for a second. Um, so is it, is it reasonably accurate to say that if, we, if we're not going to do it this year, that we, we're going to be looking at the board, looking at a bond? Is that, is that what you're saying, or are you not saying that? I'm not I'm saying that's a possibility. The ideal scenario, try to do it all at once at the same time, that way you know it's all the same time frame, it's all like the same lifespan. Um, that'd be the ideal thing. Again, we're not going to put that in the right. budget. It's discussing, you know, options, ideas with Denise, uh, Audrey, Sue, and obviously you people as well to find out what bonds are out there that are ready. I mean, can we do that? I don't know. I'm just the one that brings this information to you and how we finance it is we put on it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. No, yeah. All right, thanks. Welcome, Dad. Thank you. Right. So just a straw poll again. Um, are we in favor of this record reduction in the budget? Taking it out. Taking it out. Taking it out of the budget. Yes, taking it out of the budget. Yes, take it out. Okay, thank you. So as we've talked through the budget, uh, we've mentioned that we continually, every single day, every you know, cost center is looking at their budget, analyzing their budget, looking at student enrollment, looking at schedules, looking at you know, a multitude of factors. We just don't um, put the budget away until Thursday nights. We're looking at it all the time. So in, with that said, and looking at the next item, um, it's um, a recommendation to remove one world language teacher at the high school. Um, that's $57,800. Um, again, that is, that is new. That's new. And that's part of the process of continually, continually revisiting, scheduling, revisiting enrollments. Um, so that is the recommendation. Yes. Yes. So, yes. So I've not eliminated a position and it's not put in a new position that was proposed. No, it's eliminating a position. It's eliminating. Yes. So are we cutting down the size of one of our languages or? Yeah. 
So, Principal Duport, do you want to come on? Sure. Thank you. <laughs> this is <laughs> Thank you. No, absolutely. Um, and, and obviously, I think it you know goes without saying you've heard from numerous folks tonight that these decisions are incredibly difficult, and I would put this absolutely in that bucket. You know, we have we have seven world languages. Um, seven world language teachers at Noble High School currently. So at five sections each, 35 sections, and over those 35 sections, we teach a total of 20 different courses. When you look at the levels of, from in Spanish and French, from an exploratory course taken by eighth graders all the way up to level five. And then we do also offer four section, uh, four levels within Russian and Latin as well. Um, so it's one of those pieces where you know you look at numbers as numbers and it's like yeah this isn't hard and then you start to realize and look at okay but when you get to French and Spanish 5 when you get to certain opportunities for certain kids the numbers don't necessarily say the whole story um, but obviously we are all faced with incredibly difficult decisions so I, I would put this firmly in that bucket in the you know. hard decision bucket well just as you know there's lots of difficult you know right. so we're all trying to help make this work the best we all can you know can, so. can, you, can you have a ballpark like what did the numbers in french five and um, but yeah, it, it differs a little bit, um, and our numbers are pretty high. We have a pretty robust biliteracy program, so students earn the seal of biliteracy through the state of Maine. So I would say, and, and you guys can correct me here, I've got a couple of world language folks, but we have 15 to 20 students each year that reach that level. So I want to say, like, you know, thinking ahead to next year, like French and Spanish fours are both 17 to 22, something in that range. Is that pretty accurate? You know? High teens, low twenties at the top, for sure. And they lose that. What was that? They would lose that. Not necessarily. No, we. I mean, we'd have to become incredibly creative, but we, we would not. We would not cut courses. I think what you would see is courses sizes would get bigger. We'd have to be creative with some of our exploratory, because as folks know, or maybe you don't know, um, eighth grade is the first stop with world language in our district. So the middle school is not able to offer world language, so eighth grade is that first place. So we'd have to, we'd, we'd be incredibly creative. We, we are in other areas and, and would be. So yeah, I don't wanna say there's no impact to students, that's probably not truthful, um, but we would work to continue to still offer um, as robust of a program as we can. What does that do to the like, intro level class sizes? Yeah, um, again, creativity dependent. You know, So our, our folks have been thinking about some, some possibilities that might be possible within that exploratory. I don't think, I don't believe numbers would be crazy. Uh, I think we'd still be in the 20 to 24 range for that exploratory. Um, I, I think probably what would happen is there'd be some combination of some of the upper levels when we can, um, and really probably what would happen is some of the sections would get a lot larger at levels three and four, things like that, you know, where it's not quite, you know, obviously you have 22 students, I'm throwing out numbers in Spanish five, that's clearly one section, like that's fairly easy. It's the 28 Spanish threes. First, you're know, like, ah, I don't want 28. You know, obviously, clearly, 214s get those students ready to have the opportunity to earn maybe college credit in that world language. Like, yes. You know, I think that's where it gets trickier. It wouldn't necessarily impact either end the students who are new to the language and the students who are at the end, because those numbers become pretty easy relatively speaking, to put in the courses. Does anyone what? want further information on this topic? Does the student department feel that they can handle that reduction and that they would still be able to provide quality instruction to students? I mean, I would say, honestly, probably not. I mean, 
it's going to be hard. Like, it, yeah. sorry, being honest, I wish it was easier. I'm sorry, I wish it was a clear yes. Everyone is on board, we can make this work. It'll be hard. But, yeah, sorry. What level of language is required in high school? Yeah, so we require every student in our building to have a graduation, uh, to have an experience within world language. So we do allow some students, I would say it's a small number, under a third that sort of stop at that introductory level within, within a grade level. So maybe 50 to 60 students only take the introductory level. Um, but we are seeing, I think, for students to be able to be accepted to a four-year school, generally it's a minimum of two years, and that wouldn't include the exploratory, so that would be a one and a two. And a lot of students, and we're really fortunate this year, we have some students, um, and I'm excited for you folks to see going to some really competitive places this year, and that'll be really cool. And now you're looking at that four to five, you know, four years, five years worth of that language, because we do allow our eighth grade students coming in can take a French or Spanish one, level one. So that's what allows them to get to level five by the time they graduate. So that's required that first year in eighth grade? All of our eighth grade students have a world language experience, yes. And again, I say all, we may have a handful of students that due to special situations within their schedule, a program that they're in, they don't. But I would say absolutely, by and large, every eighth grade student is either in exploratory, which is a half year opportunity, or the full year Spanish one, French one. And what is the, I don't know if you have the number of the kids. That's okay. That, what is the um, average of kids? I mean, you said about 50 or 60 don't continue it. Mm -hmm. It used to be exploratory, but what is the average that continues on in, in year after year? What's the average of students that we have? Yeah, and so it, I guess I would say 50 out of the, I'm going to broadly use the number 250. We don't have 250 in every class, but for ease of numbers, so under 20% stop at that level, and we get probably about 10%, 2018, you know, so in that 10% range, go all the way to level five. I would say more typically stop at level two or three. The majority of our level four students continue to level five. It's one of those that you're like, almost there, so you might as well see about earning the college credit, getting those experiences, that seal of biliteracy, which is a pretty robust test. It makes sense to sort of finish that sequence at that point, if that makes sense. Um, and they earn the college credit for that. They do, yep. Yep, it's a, it's a program through the state of Maine, so they, earn, they take those credits with them. I went a long time ago. I went to French four, and I like, I don't even think we had 10 kids in our French four class. Mm -hmm. And the level, like, I definitely remember the level of instruction required for that to have, like, such large classes. What's, what's that going to do with the education of the kiddos involved in those grades, like, of level four or five? Yeah, and again, I think probably it's going to impact most, like, the twos and threes. One's twos and threes. The exploratory numbers will stay similar. And those fours, again, most all of our students that take the level four take the level five. So we have, I believe at this moment, 18 or 19 juniors predominantly in level four. We do have a few students who are in level three that are working to double up. They're gonna do it over the summer. Um, because it's, it's like one of those, you know, the way our system is, it's like a rite of passage to be able to get to the end of that sequence. So we do have some students who are level three as juniors who are gonna double up to get to level five. So kind of the fours and fives say there won't be a big difference at that level. It's more the twos and threes. Yeah, so that'd be my concern, mm -hmm. is that we might discourage some students from going to level four or five and that the twos and threes is not as robust. Yeah, I mean, we I hope not. To, I hate to make a statement like this, but I, I think this country is just lacking in students or employees that are bilingual or speak. I know my industry, it's a real problem that we don't have. So I'd love to see a bigger focus on that. Mm -hmm. no, no problem. And again, I think, you know, in talking to our folks, our folks will make it work. I don't know if any of you had the opportunity to come out um, to the event that we had last week, or still last week. Um, 
with our like world language culture fair and seeing the students up on stage. There were hundreds of students with posters set up. So it's, I mean, absolutely, when you say in our building, there's certainly that world language focus permeate. So I have no doubt that our people will do amazing things because they're amazing people and they always do amazing things. So again, I, I don't, this is hard. We will make it work. <coughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Any further questions for discussion? <laughs> yes. Okay, so the straw pool, and this is to remove one world language teacher in high school. Okay. Okay. So
calling the officer in when there is someone who is um, having an episode, I guess is how I want to say it. And um, there was some questions around that, and there was a, a um, participant who said that her, she's an emergency room nurse, and that her, um, which she has seen in the past, but that was a handcuffed fifth, fifth grader coming into the uh, so she, with the police officer. So I'm not saying that's the only thing, I just want to finish. Yeah, what we, um, we asked about that, and I really do caution on that. I really think that our staff does need to make sure that they're trained. I know that they're trained, but make sure everybody knows that this is, must be the absolute last resort if this goes through, because I just don't think that's appropriate. I don't, I don't, I don't, I just have a lot of questions about that. I just don't want to see the child get hurt. There be a lot around that, because I know they're trained especially, but I just, I would like to have answer some questions about the training that they talked about in that meeting, um, to see what their training is with special needs, um, very special training for that, and what it is for just um, handling young, young, young kids. So, I'm, I'm just to speak to that quickly in terms of that conversation. The, the woman who asked that question was an emergency room nurse who has been um, has experienced young children brought in with um, the police, and that is not. Some, so I, I, I think that the bottom line is, is that it does reflect the mental health crisis in our in our country and the fact that the kids are, are being, unfortunately, the police are being utilized as um, that agency basically to move, you know, to get, get folks help, um, which is a very different position than another, to be honest with you, because um, that was a typical police officer dealing with crisis at home. But, Yes, and I think regardless, there's a huge amount of question about what training is provided, and the, uh, there was a, a deputy there also who kind of talked about that a little bit. Um, but I think, honest, that, so that the biggest part of this is um, where does this fall for us as a district in terms of providing service specifically for 11, and I think that was one of the big questions regarding Berwick and North Berwick High School. So, we're struggling with that. Sure. The selectmen were there? Yes. So some, they, some were. Some were. Yeah, some were. Yeah. Did they contribute or comment? Um, that would be, I don't think so. I don't think they did at all. I think they did, they, they did listen and hear what was going on. Right. Yeah. So we don't get any sense of whether they're, they'd be willing to. There was a question for, regarding uh, whether or not the um, this officer could be utilized specifically in Lebanon over the, the, the three months of the time when not in session, school in session. And um, so that was, the, I think, the only real question that they talked about. And Sheriff King noted that that isn't an option. So, because it's a, it's a, it's a so it's a, it's a partnership with the Sheriff's Department and with the school district. So when the person is working for the Sheriff's Department, and, um, they need to be wherever they're Patrols are not necessarily specific to Lebanon. I want to just I just want to speak on this one. I feel like I I was a huge supporter of this, and one of the reasons why is because Lebanon doesn't have um, police of any kind versus the other um, four elementary schools. And someone sent an email to the board and um, explained it in a way that really got me thinking and shared that it's not like the other two towns have police officers or police forces. Lebanon doesn't, so why should that be a district burden? And then what I learned at Tuesday meeting is that towns can have a contracted officer through the sheriff's office. And after learning that, I would really like Lebanon to pursue that option first. And if they can't get anywhere, then like I think this is great to revisit. But I don't ask, and this took me a while to get here tonight. Don't love it because they're part of our district. They want all the kids to. You know, be protected, and I want all the teachers and kids to feel safe and everything. Um, but knowing that this is something that Lebanon could pursue and to put them on the same like, playing field as the other two towns, I think I would like to see that happen first. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Um, I just want to say we do have sheriffs in the town. No, you know who the contract is. So we I didn't know this. They, they are in town. Okay. okay. But, but no, the difference, what she's saying, you do have a sheriff's office in town. Yes. But they could also be patrolling three other towns. What Possibly. she's talking about is Possibly. they have a contracted officer that is dedicated oh, sure. but to the, the town. The level. point is, even if we had our own police department, we'd have to hire somebody else. So I don't think that's a viable excuse, or whatever you want to call it. But the other, the, other, the other elementary schools don't have one kind of thing. We have police. However, they are available here to go to elementary schools because they're close. Lebanon's way over here. They're not going to get there in time. Um, so, but I think it's just the way it is. I, I think what Laura's saying is that before we front money for a school resource officer, the town of Levitt should be looking at paying for a contract, a dedicated officer to the town of Levitt. And then well, we I don't know they have one specific officer because I have seen different ones, but they are there. Yeah, they're, well, they're there, but they're also in other towns. Yeah. They don't have one set just to patrol the town of Levitt. Right, because they can, they can go to other towns if needed, and they may not be living in without coverage. Whereas a contracted one means we have coverage all the time. That's what it's But we do pay money to the sheriff, so. Absolutely, we do, so. but we can do the contract if they did bring that up at the meeting. And we have in the past tried to contract. And it's been in town. So we got it done. And this is more than one year. Our SRO would be three. So this is to remove the school resource officer of Lebanon from the budget because it is reflected currently in the budget. Application list. 
who are interested. But until I know that, we can, that, that the balance is there financially for students and for the, the number of staff necessary, I feel like I need, I feel like I responsibly need, and this is killing me, just, so you know, to just to press pause and say I have to find a grant in order to continue this. That it can't necessarily come from the taxpayer funds right now. So that's where I'm at. Um, as you saw, it is a great program. It really does fit a niche group of kids that really are probably your, some of your highest flyers in terms of, of the world, in terms of like the, the interest levels that they have. Um, I'm hopeful that we will not have them return just completely to homeschooling. There is options for like being able to utilize um, a hybrid model actually for homeschool and also using public school as well until I can figure out how to open this back up again. That is, that's where I'm at. It doesn't feel good, I don't like it. Um, so, so you're saying possibly for next year, there's six moving on, <coughs> maybe 14 to come in, so roughly you might have 20. Mm -hmm. But that's, but I, I am not able to confirm that. Oh, I know. I know. So I'm not, I just feel like I need to be able to put this forward. Because even 20, if they can get 20 kids, mm -hmm. that's almost $13,000 per kid if you buy it up, which if you look on here, mm -hmm. that's what we're at. I number the kids in everywhere else. Mm -hmm. <coughs> right? It is, it's the same. It is, like, it is, you're right. Are there, are there potentially students that, are there students that don't know about this? I, I'm looking at this and the students who spoke tonight and think this is the answer to a lot of issues. Mm -hmm. I know one or two of my kids mm -hmm. had, I would have taken advantage of that in a heartbeat. And if we take that away from some of those students, yeah, I, I, I feel like I, the, our, our flex group, the kids themselves, the parents, the staff have been really pushing this out there, trying to get, they utilize social media, um, they, put, they, they really have tried to drum up applications and, and to, to make this truly viable. I, I cannot say anything except for how impressed I am with the group. It's just the question of how do I, how do we balance this? Carefully, so we're not going to stop trying. Like we, we, it's March, right? But I need to be, I need to be honest that you know I'm not sure that I can garner enough students in order to make this a viable option. What is the capacity of the flex program? Um, we, you know, you remember, I have like 26, I think we have, which is a really good group. Um, and what happens is we have our two learning coaches who are working with those kids, but you have to really, and then they explain it. But it's a wide range of, of students in a wide range of ages, so that's more than you, that's plenty. <laughs> that's plenty of kids. I know in the past we kind of had some discussions around um, expanding this possibility. Mm -hmm. um, so, hmm. And we have a year under in London here. We have, yeah, we have. And we do have a couple of students on the list that are from away, um, with in terms of that are on the application list. But we like we're there's not yet true follow through with them. <coughs> Can we give them uh, at some point a little bit more information about what is going on at the high school for the Sure, we'll make AJ do that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you want to do that? I'm willing to. Yeah. 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 It's not. It's a. It's a different program. Right? In, incredibly yeah. different. Yeah. Honestly, full. Yeah. I and full disclosure. It is very, very different. And from an age perspective. It works okay because we're not dealing with that, I would say, very sort of delicate age of fifth to eighth graders. So it, it is very different. We are able to, and I think the other difference is, let me back up, we need to be able to offer high school credit. So that is a difference. So, you know, we're beholden to the, um, you know, MSAD 60 graduation requirements. So helping students to work through those. 
Um, our program is almost exclusively online. So as the kiddos and, and coaches talked about at the yurt, they're able to be in person two days a week. We are, from a learning perspective, online four days. Uh, we're online all five days. We do offer a one in-person day, so while our staff is doing their Late Start Wednesday professional development, Amber was actually gracious enough to come over with our students at the beginning of the year who are working in that remote program. That allowed them access to school counselors when thinking about future plans, what you might want to do, um, access to our ELO coordinator to be what, how can we get you out into the community in a meaningful fashion? So for example, beginning of the year, because of the connection that the folks have with the FLEX program, the students who want it, we do make that in-person optional, because again, we have 17-year-olds that are working 15 hours a week. They're like, I don't need to come in to school on Wednesday morning, I just want to do the school part. Um, and that was okay, we don't require it at that point, we try and make it make sense, but a lot of the students, especially the younger ones, it is really helpful to have that personal connection. Because some of the kiddos may be home predominantly by themselves during the day. So our classes, and this is where it gets a little bit tricky, so sort of bear with me, but courses are online, we have a live teacher available. So for example, math for all of our virtual kiddos happens day one block four, because it has to fit within the Noble High School schedule. So it happens from 1 to 2.25 on Mondays and Thursdays. Students log in, their teacher is there, but students in grades 9 through 12 are there. So they're not able to teach live lessons. So when you think of something like a virtual academy, the Main Connections Academy or one of those programs, they may have 50, 100 or more students taking Algebra 1 in that program. We don't have that. We have maybe five students taking Algebra 1, four taking Geometry, three doing Algebra 2, and you know two in Pre-Calc, four in a senior math course, so they're very much spread out. So what happens the first 15 minutes or so with every class is a, is a sort of live lesson that everyone can do. So in math it focuses a lot on probability and statistics. Let, let's look at statistics, let's do something meaningful with math. Then the students go off and break out to work on and we have an online learning um, program called Plato um, that students log into. It's put out, you know, like one of the education online programs. Students go on to um, and work. Teacher is there, teacher stays online with them for the whole block, checks in in breakout rooms on Google Meets, things like that. If you look at an English course, they're reading a novel, but again, the bulk of the work, you know, and sort of the meeting of our standards, the meeting of our expectations, are happening through that online program, and we go ahead and supplement. One thing we have learned with this being the first year is like in things like science, we need to add way more lab opportunities, because that was something that was missing for students. You can't, you know, reading about and answering questions about science is not sufficient. So we're going to be able to add to that. Like, you know, it's going to be tricky. I think the one advantage that we have with those students for our teachers that are teaching in that program, they're not full time in that program. It is their one block of their, of their overall teaching responsibility. So we don't have any staff that are fully dedicated to that program. Our science teacher is our biology teacher. Her fifth class, you know, we have one teacher teaches marine biology with their fifth class, one teaches AP biology. She teaches virtual pathway science. Um, so again, it's not able to dive into the depth. I think the advantage is that we have is as students get older, we're able to help them access early college opportunities, things of that nature. So. I think in our perfect world, those students aren't necessarily doing four years with us logging in with the same teacher for all of their core subjects. Our hope is for their you know, junior and senior history, they're accessing York County Community College, maybe online in one of their online classes. I think my hope for a lot of them would be to get in person 
to do those courses, and we try and build up to that and build successful opportunities. But so we're not able to replicate that piece. We just don't we don't have the full time staff available, and so we we are very much piecemeal. Um, but we are able to help students who life situation working with the family, helping them access their education when otherwise it would be difficult. So it's sort of a lot, but certainly any questions that you have or things that you're thinking about, um, you know, we do offer and then sort of that piece we've learned as we go along, like needing that health requirement, needing that world language graduation requirement, like things like senior project, which is a class that all of our students take that is a research class <coughs> on the topic of their choice. It's like, ooh, that is really hard. So like, as we're building this, and we're still building it, um, and there will be some certain improvements for next year, some things that were like, that was great, that worked really well, and other things, for example, I spoke about like the science labs. We really need a lot more of that. Ballpark figure, how many kids are ac students are accessing this? We have 20 to 22, 23, in that ballpark, low 20s. Um, and there's a little bit, <coughs> In and out, we have some students that will transition back. I think that is one of the pieces with using the online platform we use. It does allow, because we're tracking student standards, it does allow students to come back in to class. It, it's not perfect, certainly. Like, we're not guaranteeing they're reading the same books at the same time. But with some notice, you know, a lot of times, like, hey, at the semester break, if you want to make a change, we can do that. So it does allow for some on-ramps and off-ramps. So, um, what's a typical turn time for getting a grant? Are you looking at six months, a year? Yes and yes? Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, we're just going to look for appropriate pieces that were one of the, the, the whole <coughs> big part of this program was developed with Ann Dixon, who is our school health coordinator, in conjunction with uh, Bridget Dumont. That was how it all started with us. Um, and so we were just able to find funds to support it. So, so I'm looking at the strategic plan. Mm -hmm. Guide us to mm -hmm. the beginning of this, and I was at those sessions. Um, so I'm thinking as we go through these things, I'm considering the concerns that our community members voiced at those meetings. So the school safety one, I'm, I'm sad about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but this one too, this is a multiple pathway, and it's strong. Mm -hmm. What else do we offer? that supports that part of our strategic plan. And I don't have a great answer for that except for the work that our elementary and middle schools do to try to connect with students individually through a variety of different, um, our specialists and our, and our counselors and our teachers who are really fabulous. Um, but it is true that this is a very unique opportunity for students to find their uh, find their people. So now that you said that, I would say that collectively, as we go through these, we should be aware. Yeah. Because we're going to take all of them. We just sort of stepped on the work that we asked community members to do. Yeah. And what we believe in our hearts, right? Absolutely. Think that's what, what we're here as educators for a reason. And so this is why this is the hardest time of the year. It was really neat. Um, first of all, all those I presented and talked about Flex, um, that, was, that was really awesome to hear um, just the niche that it filled. Um, it made me think, the whole time I was listening to it, it made me think of, I think it's the current day version of a one-room schoolhouse. Um, and one-room schoolhouses were incredibly effective. Um, and, and they were overflowing with the students. And I think, you know, one of the things that I am excited about in this district is that we are willing to be innovative and try new things. I mean, that's, that's great, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. I think that's wonderful. Um, but I also think it's, it's incumbent upon board members to review, to ask the administration to review programs. And, and we need to acknowledge that it's not, it's not um, viable at a certain point. And I do encourage our administration to continue to figure out how this can be done. Say, one room schoolhouse, I'm all about. It. That's awesome. But it's just, it's just not there right now. And I, I think it's important to acknowledge that. It's not to, it's not to uh, dismiss the effort that was done and the work that has been done. Certainly, the work we, we talked about as a board at those meetings. 
um, that we certainly want the work that has been created um, it flows out, right, and, and becomes integrated throughout all our schools and our students' experiences. Um, so uh, I think it was a success in a large part of a lot of ways, but it's important to look at all facets and constantly review things. I just think that balanced approach is important. Any further questions, comments, any further information needed? Okay, so now the, the job goal is to remove noble flex from the budget. Okay. Amber, we live to fight another day. For now. <laughs> but thank you. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I'm constantly looking at Thank you. So this next um, item is a continuation from the discussion last week, um, and that is to consolidate the K-5 specialists at North Berwick and Milton School. That's $190,000. When we presented the schedule last week, we had it by classroom versus by specialist. So we um, had the, teach, um, the school administrators come back with the current schedules and then what it would look like when consolidated. So for example, the first page um, is STEAM. So North Berwick Elementary School has STEAM. And then underneath that is Knowlton School, so those are the current sections. And then to the right is the proposed schedule with it consolidated. And as our specialists have said, and which I believe all of our administrators would agree on, is that while the places stay open, they are certainly busy. Um, what we are reflecting here is when it says a grade two class, that's a class, so that's the special. That's the time that the entire class goes in. There is a misconception, I believe, at least from what I heard this evening, is that we're trying, like, the misconception about cutting specials, that is not, that's not a discussion. Um, every student would still receive the same amount of specials that they had this year, that they had last year. Um, this is, is, as I said last week, this is to write the changes that we've made in, in, based on enrollment and class sections going down in schools so that we are fully utilizing um, our time. And I'm not, again, I'm not saying that it's not being utilized. It is, but there's a difference between the spec just the difference between sections in different buildings. We haven't caught up to some of that, and this is more equitable. So again, it's not to cut a special for a class of students. So it's two positions, or what is it? It's three. So it would be STEAM, library, PE, I want to say there's a okay. Music, we weren't, music because of the band right. is complicated, so it was not, okay. it was not band. So art as well. Yeah. Art, yeah. yeah. So looking at this, you know, it does say right now that those uh, instructors have duties, and when you uh, post schedule, it says it does not include the duties, but will teachers have to pick up more duties? Well, where do you put the duties, though? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <clears throat> so will the teachers have so, to? So, yeah, so do you want to? <coughs> principal's always coming to speak just to the duty part. Just lower this microphone. <laughs> <laughs> if you're referring to the, the blue box that says D-free lunch, that's their duty-free lunch. 
For the duties right now, because there's the openings in the schedules, our specialists do fill a lot of the duties. So yes, the teachers would have to most likely at North Berwick pick up some of the duties, but there still is some flexibility in the schedules. So if you're looking at the steam block, um, when I did looking at Tuesday, 8, 10 to 9 is open. So the steam teacher would likely do a duty there, a morning duty. Um, continuing on Tuesday, if you go down a few rows in the blocks, you'll see 11.45 to 1 o'clock open. That's during our lunch block. So I would have the steam teacher support um, a duty during lunch or recess at that time as well. So even, um, even with the consolidation of, of both schools, there still would be opportunities each day for the specialists to support duties around the building. One of the proposed changes that I'm seeing is actually appears to be a violation of Maine law. And uh, if you work six consecutive hours, you're required to have a 30 minute push break. You're only given them a 20 minute push break. So by, by, by staff contract, yes, 20 minutes. It's 20 yes. minutes. It's contract, yeah. Okay. Which is only 15, by the way, by the time you get the kids down. Yeah, you're not going to give them enough time to walk. That's what, that's what everybody currently has. That's a good point, though, Trevor. Because that's because of the lawyer. Years, I couldn't get to that. Correct. But we can do that with such a contract? It's right there, Bonnie. I know. But how do you write a contract? It's against me and the law, which is what I just pulled up right now. So. We might want to look into that a little further. Well, I, I can't imagine at this point it's been that way forever that somebody has brought up this against the law. A lot of the special teachers share about like the extras they do and the kids that they help during these open times and how they realize like how is if they're taken away from that. How's that going to impact a large group of kids at each of the schools? So we can have the principals talk about that, but before they, they speak to that, what I'd like to say is this is where some of that equitability comes in right now because what is afforded at one of the schools, because the, the numbers of classes is less than another school, those schools don't have the same opportunities for that. And so we're not necessary like it's it's a push and pull it's a really hard thing um so i'm going to ask again principal jolly and principal keniston to come up and just speak a little bit to that yes certainly and I, it is important to know that this is a very tough budget season and this discussion isn't easy either because i love my staff and it's wonderful to have them here in the capacity that we have However, I'm recognizing that you know there's a lot of big things on the table. We have a lot of really important decisions that impact students really drastically. Um, so I kept that in mind as we talked about what this could look like and recognize the pros and the cons of it. At North Berwick this year, we've been grateful that we've been able to offer some clubs to students, um, given the free time and the schedule that, that has been there. Um, our specialists do different things like the check-in, check-out system for students, but I also know that they are phenomenally dedicated people, and on the days that they will come to the building, if this moves forward, they're going to give 150% like they currently do. And the North Warwick staff is truly one of the most committed and wonderful staff I've ever had the privilege of working with. So I also feel very confident that if this was something that was approved, you would still see positivity come through every day in the building. You would see the staff continue to rise up and fill any gaps to exist because they do do that. We are not an overly staffed school. Um, and every day I see members of, of our team go above and beyond. So I feel confident that they would continue to do that. With the flexibility that's there, this is just a draft. So you know, if, if this was something that you that you decided to move forward with, I would sit down and really confidently look at what the schedule looks like and see if there was still an opportunity to provide some clubs. A big vision I do have is I would love for one day a week, each grade level had an open block where they'd be able to go do a club with one of the specialists. I don't know if that would be feasible just yet, but once I know what next year will look like, I'll try to be creative and make that happen, at least for some of the upper grades. 
So it would be a little different, but I feel confident that I can be creative at North Norway to still provide some of those opportunities. Uh, I think. <laughs> yeah, so it uh, feels very much like when I, I, I don't know if people know that I became principal right behind Elva. So, um, I think the, the same is true. Um, we do, there are a ton of things that happen at Milton School that happen every day some of which you know people know about some of which i find out even afterwards you know you may go think that the art room is free and find that there's an entire class working on a project that uh, is really a classroom-based project but has brought in an art component um, i know this afternoon there was a class that was going out with our pe teacher for an extra time. Those are things that happen because people are in the building. Um, that wouldn't happen in that way organically. We're looking at two days a week. Um, but again, we were we were asked to look really hard at what we have and how we're using people. Um, I know the board asked last week if there were ways that we could, you know, on paper, I think make people's schedule more true to what they are or really showcase what they're doing. Um, certainly we can do that. Um, but if we're looking at budgetarily, something needs to happen. Again, like Liz said, um, I don't ever build a building schedule in my office by myself the way I built this to see if it would happen. Um, so certainly a scheduling team would come together and really look at what would make sense to our, our building. Um, and just one clarification, the consolidations would be a PE, an art, and then we have this interesting position where Knowlton has one person doing STEAM and library, um, and we supplement that with the art teacher so the kids see the art teacher and the STEAM teacher three times every two weeks. Small schools, kind of weird things happen like that. So the other position would be a STEAM position. So we'd share a librarian in both buildings, share a STEAM teacher in both buildings. So those are the three positions. PE, art, and STEAM. Would kids still have access to the library when the next librarians weren't there? Um, the way that it currently works is Milton students go to library once every other week and then we set up both at library times. There's also intramural funds that are available like four clubs if, if any staff is, is um, interested in running activities after school or throughout different parts like Yeah and that's yeah. not specific to special. Milton right now is uh, like on Thursdays, today, we had, um, I with three other staff members run a cooking club after school, we had a fingerboarding club, and we had a chess club all happen this afternoon. Um, those are things that our staff across does every time a kid says, can we do this? Someone seems to say, yes, we can, um, which is exciting. Any further questions? For the PE schedule, I don't currently see, and if it's on here, and it's probably I'm not realizing. Um, we did one. We put that on like for our life plan to all that. And the our our leap for life is done by our OTPT. Say that again? That's done by our OTPT and our special ed staff. Okay, I feel like I don't know where we're at least the gym teacher is involved. I don't know the design of the program, I just know that that's. The case, and I don't see that reflected here. Currently, it's ours important. happens on Friday when um, our PE teacher is at her. And we schedule ours based off of OT, PT schedules, so I wouldn't know that just yet. Any further questions? Okay, so the straw poll 
is to consolidate K-5 specialists at North Berwick and Nolan School that will be R, P, E, and S, D.
following is to reduce the teaching and learning consultant line in the um, teaching and learning budget. Uh, typically, we have a, a placeholder for consultants so that if we're working with schools throughout the year and something comes up where there may need to be some assistance with um, you know, any kind of curriculum work, social studies, could be behavior, any, a multitude of things. Um, that line in the budget is for those types of items, so we are uh, proposing to reduce that by $15,000. Any questions, further information needed? So does that totally eliminate funding for any kind of emergency or, or special? No, schools do have money in their budgets themselves for professional development that we worked you know, through with them to make sure that that was adequate and there is still some money in the teaching and learning budget should something come up. Okay, yes, thank you. Yes. Any further questions, comments? Do, do we currently, do we have any consultants currently by the district, like on an annual basis? We do have consultants, yeah, yeah. We do have, as, some, as we talked about, there's some in special ed, there's some that are currently in the, in the school budget, yeah. I mean, I guess not related to this, but it is related. I, I, I don't, I'm trying to remember I saw them in the budget, so we would get some follow-up on that. Where, where are those consultants located on budget, as part of budget chair? Yeah, so when we go through some of this, it'll come up. Thank you. Sure. Um, so, <coughs> questions, comments? Okay, so the straw poll is to reduce the teaching and learning consulting line in the budget by $15,000. Okay. The next one is to remove the district health coordinator local portion only. That's $44,800. Yeah, okay. So, this is. Um, this is not a market, honestly. Um, so, and it actually didn't pop up until um, it was questioned, I think, added to the, the sheet last week. So, but I, I'm, I'm taking the due diligence. We've looked at it carefully. I've talked with um, Aaron about it. Um, we, so the past, we've had a health coordinator in the district since 2001. Um, and it, it has been one of those things that's helped us Align curriculum well, but really the bulk of her time has been spent on preventative, you know, measures in terms of working with students and, and substance abuse, tobacco, those kind of things. She's pulled in the district in the time that she's been with us, well over close to well, close to a million dollars worth of grant funding. So it's a, it's an important role because she spends her time also looking and looking for resources for the district as well. Um, we did discuss cutting, she is currently 50% of the time in our district, and we talked about um, cutting that to 25% of her time in the district, so that um, we could continue the preventative measures piece, particularly around vaping right now, because um, it's incredible that what's been happening in the art culture. Um, and we're going to, my other piece of that is, is that we will work diligently to fund her other 25% through an outside grant. Um, working right now with um, Betsy Kelly, who's part of the coalition um, uh, Safe and Dark Free Schools in the area, and um, hoping that she might be able to supplement us so that we can continue her truly in 50% time frame, but um, 25% from us. Um, and what we see here, that 448 is also includes, um, it's not just her salary, but it's also her line for, you know, um, supplies and PD and stuff like that. So that's where that is. I know. It's a hard one, but again, it's that whole piece of, I, I feel pretty strongly that I sh can find this in an outside fund to support this. Um, because Erin's been valuable and what she's brought to the district. So are you saying that we're going to remove the blue line totally or reduce it by 50 percent? We're going to reduce it by 50 percent, but the so but uh, the local portion is going to be removed. We, she is funded through Title V right now, which is part of our um, ESEA grants. So it's about 18,000 or something that's 
that's in that in that portion of the budget. So I will be talking as we rewrite our ESEA application for next year that we might fund a little bit more in the low in, just to make sure that 25% is coming. Okay, thank you. Does that make sense? Well, um, in theory, I should be able to find the coverage through an outside grant, but I have been very frank with Aaron that I can only guarantee 25%. There's that, which I think is a really big deal and a big concern in the community. But also, so that 44 8 we're going to give up and potentially lose the time she has to write millions of dollars of grants. And <laughs> there is that. I mean, it is, it's, 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 it's all there. Because time is huge, right? Being able to write grants, um, that's what we do. Twenty bucks at a time. <laughs> yeah. But I wanted to at least put forward because it had been brought forward in terms of the questioning of it, and I, I recognize that, and I think it's um, something that needed to be considered. Any further questions, comments? Yeah. So when would you know whether that can be covered in the grant? So Betsy and I chatted the other day, and she's looking at her budget process um, in early to mid-April, wrapping things up probably the end of April. Yeah, but in the meantime, I'll still be digging around for other things. Okay, so the straw poll is to remove the district health coordinator local portion only for 44,800. Just right up, and as we go through it, you will see the work that went into this. 
So it is amazing. We also had a lot of staff input when we were asking uh, for things. We've been working on this since Friday morning last week, right after the board meeting, and we stopped five minutes before <laughs> before we walked in. Six fifteen. Six fifteen. Okay. Okay. So I just have a lot of gratitude for our administrators and our staff that helped to pull this all together. Um, it, for ease, and just looking at this document, um, these were exactly taken off of that Google Doc. So assistant athletic director, school health coordinator, positive behavior intervention support, and interventions and support. All of the supporting documents are on here, but due to the time, Due to the fact that we've got to get this done by you know next week and the week after, what we've done is we've compiled highlights for you that we are going to read off. And then there are supporting information packets behind all the highlights. Um, so again, some of these may be easier than others. So when we open it up for discussion, we can talk about if you want to go to the strong poll or not. Again, some of these are like somewhat easy in the fact that it's straightforward. I don't mean an easy cut, I just mean it's like straightforward with data, straightforward with everything. Um, so we're gonna start with the, um, and Sue and I are splitting it based on how we, how we compile information. Um, so we're going to start with the highlights of the assistant athletic director. So as you can see, next to that highlight, um, that's the first document, there is $68,000. That is the um, what is in the budget for this position. And on each highlight page at the bottom, after we go through the bulleted items that we wanted to highlight, we, we meaning um, our administrative team, the central office, we have a recommendation. Um, and that's just for ease of um, just going through the process. So the highlights of the assistant athletic director, and I am sorry that I'm gonna read through some of these, but just again, we wanna get through uh, as much as we can this evening. Um, if we need to bring some forward back next week, that's perfectly fine, but we just wanna get it all out there. Um, so the assistant athletic director provides coverage, crowd management, and ensures the safety of all players, coaches, and officials for all home con contests at Noble Middle School and supports large events at Noble High School. So 100 middle school events and 25 to 30 Noble High School events. This includes tournaments, regional and state championship events at Noble. Hires and evaluates 32 coaches, 10 volunteer coaches for 24 teams and programs each year. Holds preseason coaches meetings and attends practices to evaluate coaches, athletic, athletic fields and spaces, meets with parents and coaching staff as necessary if and when concerns arise. Enforces policies and procedures for student eligibility and this occurs daily. Coordinates with the district facilities director for regular field maintenance, painting and game lines, stringing nets, removing natural debris, lining fields when the maintenance staff is unavailable. Attends monthly Southern Maine Middle School Athletic Conference meetings and serves as the point person for cross country and boys and girls lacrosse. This includes creating the master schedule and updating lead bylaws for 27 member schools. The recommendation of the administration is to continue this position for 2025. Uh, questions, further information, discussion? How many meetings do they actually have at the athletic conference? Aaron, do you want to answer that question? How many meetings? times? How many meetings? Yeah. Time? <laughs> Excuse me, I still have the uh, comp from a couple of weeks ago that we had our board workshop. Okay, so we're going to raise this. Sorry. I feel like I'm late. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Lance. Appreciate like it. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the middle school assistant athletic director attends monthly uh, meetings for the Southern Maine Middle School Athletic Conference, which begins in September and runs all the way to the end of the school year in June. Um, as a former middle school athletic director, assistant athletic director, athletic director, and high school athletic director, currently I attend similar meetings for the SMAA, which is the Southwestern Maine Activities Association. Um, at those meetings, we discuss kind of day-to-day -day operations of what we need to do for
for all of our sports, uh, individual sport liaisons, again, Alex, the assistant athletic director, as Andra alluded to, uh, creates the master schedule for boys and girls lacrosse and cross country. Um, so that's kind of what those meetings entail. It's, it's a lot of business discussion, um, talking about financials of the league, talking about what each sport needs. Um, each liaison kind of advocates for, for that individual sport or the 27 member schools. And how much of it, uh, once a month, it's how much time? Typically, uh, well, it depends. Uh, meetings typically last between two, two and a half hours up in Scarborough. Further questions for Aaron? Thank you. Thank you. So behind the highlights document that, that I um, just read is um, more detailed information if you need that or if you want to move to a small pool, you can do that. It's really, this is your discussion, this is your time now to, to talk through some of this. Is there, can we, just because it's 10.30 at night. Yes. Can, can we go through this and then um, I don't wish drop all next week or when we have time That's to read this point? Yes. I think if That's the administration spent hours right. making this, yes. I'd rather yes. give it a good deal. Yes. Yes. Yep. That's Thank fine. you. Is everybody okay with that? I can just over give an overview now and next week we will come back and forth once. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or the next one? Yeah. Or the next one? The next one is the third one, highlights positive behavioral interventions and supports, PDIS, $18,800. Positive behavioral interventions and supports is an evidence-based framework for creating safe, positive, and equitable schools where every student can feel valued, connected to the school community, and supported by, supported by caring adults. 24-25 will be the second year of implementation for North Berwick Elementary, Hussey School, Hanson and Lebanon Elementary Schools. It will be year three of implementation for Nolan School. School teams receive ongoing training and in turn bring training back to the school buildings for practical application. Um, you can see some of the school-wide focuses of professional development, common documents. There's an example here of the Nolan School behavioral flowchart and at the bottom of this, is the school board PBIS presentation that was done at Knowlton School when we were visiting Knowlton School earlier in the year. Um, and that's a link if you want to go back and um, just get a reminder of those pieces. The recommendation is to continue this school-wide model for 25. Professional learning communities is the next one. That's $28,500. A PLC, or professional learning communities, focus is to improve instructional practices and student learning outcomes. It's a professional learning model where educators meet routinely to share and critically analyze the professional practices in a manner that is reflective, learning center, and growth oriented. Um, so uh, again, there's a, a document on the back that kind of goes through the responsibilities, what's happening in each of the elementary schools. The recommendation is to continue the professional learning communities for 25. Uh, staff stipends. So, okay. okay. I'm lost in my, I'm lost in my thing here. Okay. okay. So, one of the suggestions was just the review of all staff stipends. I wasn't really quite sure um, exactly what to do with that because there's a lot. So, but the reality is, is this is a contractual issue. Um, the language that is included in our teacher contract, I, I put down through here so you understand it, but basically it's we have to review the stipends on an annual basis. We make decisions with our administrative crew about um, which stipends are going to stay in place for the following year, and then we also work with our union on that as well. So it's it's a contractual issue, and it's a it's a relationship that we work through. Um, and we do not um, these are reviewed annually so that we don't continue things if they're not necessarily um, going to be used. And we may move funds to a different area with the support of the union so that you know, we create ourselves. They are based on, it used to be based on the base salary, and now they are basically an incremental increase on a yearly basis. It's a 1.3, oh, it's 1.5 increase. So that is that. 
um, in our world if we would just continue with those administrative fees and stipends on an annual basis. Oh, and then, here's the next one. Thank you for finding me for me. All right. Uh, the other, this one was kind of a biggie. Um, the question really came forward about closing Mary Hurt Academy. Um, they got, I believe, came from that, um, the, the, the reality that the state does reimburse us for funds over and above a $40,000 out of district placement. Um, so, as we look at this, I just want to broke it down. Um, Denise and I did it mathematically only. There's a philosophical piece that is attached to MHA as well, but just in terms of funding. Um, so tuition costs can range from anywhere from $30,000 to $140,000 per school year per student. Um, tuition costs above $40,000 are currently reimbursed to the district by the state. For example, the tuition for Maplestone in Acton is $369 per day at 180 days, which I just took for a typical school year, some are less than more. Um, that cost per year for tuition is $66,420. The state would then currently reimburse us the $26,420 over the $40,000. Note, very, very important note, uh, members of the main DOE Special Services Department have indicated to our illustrious business manager, Denise Van Campen, that this may change and or be eliminated in the future. So that is a concern to be thinking about. Continuing with the Maplestone example, this 66,420 does not include special services provided as noted in the student's IEP. Those would include OT, PT, speech, counseling, behavioral health providers, et cetera. Those are services above and beyond the tuition, and therefore those would not be reimbursed to the district. Um, those would be borne by the district. Um, the other piece that's down at the bottom that um, I forgot to, to put in, this also doesn't include transportation. The transportation costs for out of district placements are high and difficult to hire, actually for just running to find the rest. The other part that is important to note is that um, there are not a lot of out of district programs currently that are not um, full and have wait lists. And so, therefore, you have students that may not be being served and would be probably placed on like a tutoring program, which is not um, long term viable or legal. So, I have to think about that. Those are, those are the. It is the recommendation to continue these positions for fiscal year 2025. Okay, so next steps so are next week for Thursday. Um, so we just presented the information, review this information, we'll come back on Thursday to talk through this similar to how we did the um, recommendations prior to that. Um, so the question is, we've got a lot to do, you know, there's still a lot to do. Do we want to, are you able to begin earlier than 7 o'clock? And I'm going to give you the caveat first to say that we need an edit uh, to the rescheduled expulsion hearing to see if there is availability for Tuesday for the expulsion hearing. Tuesday. Tuesday, yes, Tuesday night at 6.30. We, just, we need more. Okay. Okay. Yeah, green okay. card. That's a great idea. Let's get that thing. You want? Sorry. No. Communication thing. Communication thing. Oh, you're going to be that. There's a. Okay. So is it possible to get five people here on Tuesday? Tuesday, the 26th at what time? 6.30. Six okay. 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 okay, so that's fine. Okay. So then Thursday for the workshop, it's just going to be a, no, we're going to have to have a little meeting before because we need to bring some contracts forward. It's a due date for contracts. So a very brief meeting and then the workshop. Availability to start prior to 7. 6.30, 6.30 or 6. 6.30, okay. 